Hi, and welcome to Dare to Dream, a video and podcast. And it is my pleasure to be with you. And I guess when I say that, what I really want to know, because so many of you follow me through the podcast site, uh, whether that's Spreaker or iTunes or TuneIn or Stitcher or Libsyn or, you know, yada, yada, wherever you're listening to me, I just want you to know if you'd ever like to check out the visuals, I highly recommend it because I think for me personally, it takes it to a heightened experience when you get to see an interview such as this and you actually get to see the person and their energy and the animation and the synergy that gets created. And maybe my reactions and my guest reactions. So for those of you who love the visual, check it out, youtube.com slash Deb on the radio. And for those of you, not audio, listen to my car. I know lots of you who like to do that or your iPhone or However you download the information, feel free to keep doing that, but just know you have options, and I love options. So this is Dare to Dream, and my guest who's going to be on a little bit later is Anita Morjani. It is such a pleasure for me to get to know people out there who actually have a really big presence, and for whatever reason did not come into my sphere until now, like God, Goddess's perfect timing. And she's a New York Times bestselling author of the book Dying to be me. She's a speaker and intercultural consultant for multinational corporations. And a little background, in 2006, after suffering cancer for almost four years, Anita's organs started shutting down and she slipped into a deep coma. She was in that coma for 30 hours. She was rushed to the hospital and she crossed over to the afterlife during what is referred to, and we all know this, NDE or near death experience. So she came back here with choice. She chose to come back and she has a lot of deeper lessons that she learned and a lot of things she's going to share with us. And I'm excited to get to know that. I also want to thank my sponsor. I really love you guys. I have to say, first of all, thank you for creating who you are. Thinkific, the software platform for anybody who's a small business, an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. author, speaker, healer, you got to check this out. So it's T H N K dot cc slash deb you're going to get discounted prices for dare to dream only and why i bring it up is because a lot of entrepreneurs are working too hard and you want an online platform where you can sell your programs and your products with ease drag and drop it's easy it's beautiful you can make passive income and i love them because when they heard my story about my radio station I never asked. I was actually just calling them for very business type purposes because I chose them over all the other platforms to put my goods and wares up on in order to sell. And without a hitch, they heard the story and one of the owners there said, we want to sponsor you. We're going to help you. And that, so twofold, what a beautiful, generous act. And I thank them for that. And that was God, God is saying to me, source, mm -hmm. you're ready to go on camera. It's time. So Thinkific, I thank you. And again, for those of you who want the special Dare to Dream prices and the lifetime of support, which is priceless, go to thnk.cc slash Deb. So who am I? Most of you know me on this show and on this podcast, but I am also a media visibility strategist out into the world. And I help you to create a unique and fierce presence through coaching to write your book, taking your book to a guaranteed international bestseller, and getting you scheduled on media interviews. I'm a certified coach. I help my clients stop living in the shadows so they can stand out in the light and fulfill their purpose. And boy, if I'm talking light and light workers, y'all have some purpose right now. So talk, don't be afraid of visibility. Let it work for you and rock what you're here to do. So my guest... Anita Morjani, you've already heard about the cancer, the coma, and the choice to come back. Amazing. Because when she was there, she was receiving powerful truth and choices, physical form to come back to earth or continue off into this new realm, and she chose to come back. And when she regained consciousness, her cancer began to heal. Amazing doctors. She was free of countless tumors and cancer indicators within weeks. She's been a featured guest on Dr. Oz, on Fox News, The Today Show, CNN's Anderson Cooper, 
360, the National Geographic Channel, as well as the Pearl Report in Hong Kong and Head Start with Karen Davila. If you would like to learn more about her, go to anitamorjani.com. It's M-O-O-R-J-A-N-I.com. Anita, welcome to Dare to Dream. It's wonderful to have you. Wow, thank you for that beautiful introduction, really. And I'm honored to be here. Me as well. And you have an incredible story. And before we get a bit into the story, what I'd really like to know is the right now. So what is the work that you're doing out in the world right now? So right now I am writing my third book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I say my third book, um, third adult book, because I, so this is my third adult book, but I've done two children's books as well. Um, and I am constantly out speaking. Um, there's the potential of a movie being made by Hollywood of my story. So there is like, um, yeah, a lot of balls in the air right now. That's, that's what right now is. I'm also working on an online program. So um, I'm just juggling things and shifting between one project and another all day, every day. I'm curious when you say that and all the balls in the air, are any of these things that you put energy into and attention on or are they coming to you? They're coming to me. I don't believe in chasing and pursuing because this was one of the biggest lessons I learned in my near-death experience is that when you go after things, you're basically sending yourself the message that uh, these are not rightfully mine or I'm not worthy of it. So I have to really work hard mm -hmm. at chasing after it. But what I learned is that all I have to do is love myself and be who I am, be authentic, be myself. Don't be afraid to be myself fearlessly because when we are ourselves and we love ourselves enough to be ourselves and know that we're worthy and deserving, then whatever is truly ours just comes to us. And it doesn't mean you don't work. I work harder than I've ever worked before, mm -hmm. but I don't go chasing after things. I select what feels right from what comes to me mm -hmm. and I work on those. I love everything you just said. And there's a real peacefulness, right? A surrender to, to the flow of life about that. And also it seems to me it in, actually increases capacity to receive when yes. you're in that position. Yes, because one of the things I found about people who are in this genre, beautiful, spiritual people who do this kind of work of, of speaking, of writing, of teaching and healing, this kind of work, they're very good at giving, but they're not good yeah. at receiving. And what happens is when we turn off our receiving channels, we start to become drained. We become drained and our um, energy kind of dries up. And then we find that um, we can't continue doing what we're doing. And, and so this is the big mistake that many of us make. And I realized that really the priority is to take care of myself so that I can keep doing what I do. Okay, this is big. And I'll tell you why I have goosebumps. I have a video thread with two dear friends. I'm not going to name them because they may listen to this. I'm going to urge them to listen to you. But two blonde, beautiful women, incredibly spiritual, empathic, sensitive, deep, 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 doing big work. And the big thread that we've been sharing between ourselves is I'm, the thing that we keep hearing is I'm not taking care of myself. I'm exhausted. I'm worn down. I'm getting sick. I, I still need to do all this and I can't seem to extricate myself from it. I don't know what's next, but I can't stop doing this. And I have, uh, listen, I, I've been guilty of that uh, most of my life. Frankly, I've sacrificed too, myself. What I'm finding is uh, that I have a ferocity right now. And so I told them 2019 is hashtag me first. <laughs> me first. <laughs> yes. I, I figure out what this well needs. I can fill it up in whatever capacity I need before I even consider going out there. And so it's already taking place. Like it's been a gearing up to this and getting bigger and bigger. And I really want you to address this because I think this is predominant right now with people who have no idea. They know they want to, they know they need to, but how the heck do I disconnect 
in order to step into that. Wow. Okay. okay. So this is the area that I am really working on right now. So mm -hmm. in order to, uh, so to backtrack a little bit about my own life, why I work on this area of telling people they need to take care of themselves and they need to do it. It's more important they do that than take care of other people because the world needs them. So here's the thing. <clears throat> when, so I used to be a people pleaser and I pretty much would please people to the point that I became a doormat. Um, and I was always thinking of other people first. I was always running myself ragged, feeling everybody else's problems were bigger than mine. And it was exactly that. I was helping people with cancer. I would be there for them. I would feel guilty if I did anything for myself if someone else was suffering or struggling. I would feel, who am I to do this for me? How can I even go shopping and have a good time when my friend, when so-and-so is has cancer and is in the hospital and needs me there? So everybody came first. Everybody's problems were bigger than mine until I got diagnosed with cancer. And the emotions that went through my mind were really interesting because even though the first emotion was fear, it's like, I can't believe I have cancer, you know? And, but the second emotion was, ah, now I get to slow down and take care of myself. And this is the key that I tell people, you don't need an illness to take care of yourself. Your body is really wise and smart and it wants to slow down. It wants you to take care of, itself it needs recharging just like your smartphone you can't keep running it on a on a dead battery or a drained battery um, so your body then manifests something to get you to slow down and so this is why i actually tell people you need to love yourself like your life depends on it because it does mm. and i've also noticed that from the people who write to me the ones who are most susceptible to doing this, to becoming doormats and people pleasers like me, are empaths because we feel what everyone else is feeling. And because we feel what they're feeling, we need for them to feel good before we can feel good. And, but here's the downside, the shadow side of that, is that because we have this need for everyone to feel good, we attract people that maybe are bottomless pits, but just need for someone to make them feel good all the time. Mm. So we will, you know, so we're on this never ending treadmill because we think I'll feel good as soon as I make that person feel good. But what if you are, because of the way you are, you're attracting people who are only attracted to you because you need them to feel good all the time. Do you see what I mean? I do. And so those are the kinds of relationships I was attracted to. And I continued to try and make people feel good even while I had cancer. The cancer progressed. Um, I had, over a period of four years, I ended up having, it metastasized and I had stage four lymphoma. And I reached end stages where the doctors said that these were my final hours. I had tumors, some of them the size of lemons or golf balls. Um, from the base of my skull all around my neck under my arms into my abdomen um, My lungs were filled with fluid. I mean it, it, over the years the cancer really um, Yeah, metastasized. I was in really bad shape But even in that shape I would worry about like I didn't want visitors because I would think oh, if visitors come I have to take care of them it never occurred to me that these visitors were come to take, coming to take care of me. It was like, I have to put on my best face for them. I have to do this. So having visitors was a drain. I didn't want anybody to see me or come and visit me. It wasn't even the cancer that healed me of my affliction of being a people pleaser and a doormat. It was actually death. It was the NDE that where I realized like, oh my God. I have, you know, I, that's when I really realized that um, I have been sacrificing my own life to take care of other people and I never took care of myself. And the most important thing I can do is love myself, value myself, know that there is a purpose for me to be here. 
My purpose is not to be everybody else's doormat. And to know that only when I take care of myself can I actually serve my true purpose, which is what is needed here. And in serving my true purpose, I end up helping more people than if I was running around being everybody's doormat. <laughs> totally. So I am now wanting to go back to the near-death experience. It's really dramatic, and I get the movie part, because here you are, coma, you're starting to shut down, the doctors are calling it, and you slip off into another realm. So take us through that experience, and what happens? What happened to you? What did you experience? How did this all happen? So I was um, in my final hours, my organs had shut down and I went into a coma and the doctors basically told my family that I wasn't coming out of the coma and this was it. So, but while I was in the coma, I was aware of everything that was happening around me. I was aware of my, um, excuse me, I was aware of what the doctors were doing. Mm you know, they were poking needles into my veins and tubes. And I was aware of everything they were saying and what my family was saying. But then um, it was like my awareness expanded. I was aware of things that were happening beyond the hospital room. I heard conversations between my husband and the doctor that were taking place outside in the hallway at the nurse's station. Um, but it was as if I had left my body and the further away or the further away from my body I went, the more I was experiencing. I felt more expanded. But I could see my physical body lying there on that hospital bed. Hmm. And it looked so small and insignificant because now I was feeling incredible. Like all the pain was gone. All the fear was gone. I used to fear cancer. I feared death and I feared the treatment of cancer. All of that fear was just gone. I just felt incredible. And then um, I felt as though I was surrounded by loving beings. I recognized some of them as my own relatives from this lifetime who had passed away, but I didn't recognize all of them. I mean, I could tell some of them were just basically, I guess you could say guardian angels, like just mm -hmm. beautiful, powerful beings that were there to guide me. And, um, and they were all there like they were welcoming me. And it was the first time I felt loved so unconditionally. And I understood that I had always been loved, but I didn't know that. I just didn't know I'd always been loved. I Because as a child, I had been bullied and I had struggled with different things. Like I grew up in a culture um, and a race that was different from my own. And so I experienced discrimination. Uh, and so I never knew that I, in fact, we all are, but you know, I never thought it of myself that I mattered, that I was someone who had a purpose and that I had people looking out for me. And I guess I never knew that we all did. I just believed some people were more significant than others. And I realized that this is there for all of us. We just have to realize it. Um, we just have to become aware of it. I also understood that um, in actuality, we are far more than five sensory beings. We are six or we have six or more senses. You know, we all have intuition. Um, we are all born with as six or more sensory beings, but we have been conditioned to believe that we are five sensory beings. And can I ask you, when you say six or more, and you include intuition, totally makes sense. Are there others? Well, I think there are different grades. For example, I think that, um, you know, some people are just full blown clairvoyant, um, you, where they can see the spirits of other people and they become, uh, they become channels and readers and they contact your deceased loved ones. Other people um, just have this strong knowing and connection of their own purpose and why they came here. So I think there are different gradients. And the reason I say six or more is because I don't want to just limit as one sense, as a sixth sense. Whereas I think that the reason why we don't understand it so much 
is because we have suppressed it from the time we, we went to school, I guess. We have suppressed any other sense beyond the five physical ones. And because we've suppressed it, we haven't even developed a language to express it. But whereas if we embraced it and it was part of our learning, part of our schooling, part of our education, and there was language to talk about it, we would have explored it and we would have had language and words to describe deeper into the different gradients of what is beyond these five senses. So basically I'm talking about anything that is beyond these five senses. Does that kind of make sense? Totally. Yeah, that's cool. I like it. Uh huh. Yeah. So, I mean, I sometimes say like, if you, if you imagine that you lived in a world where uh, nobody had sight, just imagine that, that, nobody had sight, you know, and on the one hand, if you don't have sight, your intuition is developed. But think about a world where there's no, um, no eyesight, then the language that you develop will not have anything that, um, that you need to be able to see. For example, colors, there's no way to identify a color unless you have eyesight. So you wouldn't know, for example, that the sky is blue unless, you, you know, you, you wouldn't be able to differentiate, say, two um, plates if one is blue and one is pink, but they're identical, identical in every other way. And you're holding them. And if you don't have sight, you're like, no, they, they feel exactly the same. Um, and so if we lived in a world where nobody had sight and we were all born without sight, the words for colors wouldn't exist. You would not have blue, pink, green, you know, like the entire spectrum of colors would not be in our reality. So in the same way, because we've suppressed our intuition, an entire spectrum of words would have been developed had we accepted intuition as being as real as our other five senses, our sense of sight, our sense of smell, our sense of taste, intuition is actually as real as those other five. But we have neglected it, in fact, to the point of labeling it as our imagination, which is crazy. It's as real as the other five. And if we learned to accept it, um, then we would have developed a language for it. Like, and, I, and I know many people feel this way, I, and is that when I was a child, I used to see things, I used to see beings, but I was told it was my imagination, and I started to fear it, and I was taught that ghosts are to be feared, so I started to fear it, and because I feared it, it stopped happening. Mm -hmm. But if we embraced it, we would have language for it, and we would identify that these are our own relatives here to help us. Amazing. So you are there. You're met by your family, some that you recognize, yes. some you feel are angels. You're feeling a euphoria and a freedom you have never felt before. Yes. And what happens next? So I met my dad who had died 11 years prior to this experience. And he was there to greet me. And um, I learned like a lot of things, like the things that I just said to you. I learned that being um, that we are very much six or more sensory beings, that intuition is very real, that we had suppressed it. I learned that um, that I had to love myself, like my life depends on it, mm -hmm. um, and that it's not selfish to love myself. Um, it's in fact imperative because that's the only way that you can fulfill the purpose and the intention with which you came out into this world. Um, and, and then when I started to realize all these things, um, I started to wonder like, how come I'm only finding this out when I'm dying? It's such a waste. Why didn't I know it when I was born? And then I had the understanding that actually we are all born knowing it but it gets conditioned out of us. Every single one of us is born knowing that we have a purpose and we're coming here to leave the world a better place than before we came, but we forget our purpose and we get conditioned with different things. And so anyway, I, I reached a point and I'm 
kind of there's a lot to to this and I could talk about it for hours but I reached a point where I was made to understand that this is as far as I could go and if I went any further I wouldn't be able to turn back now no part of me wanted to turn back because mm. I had uh, I had just left a sick and dying body I had been suffering I'd been in pain and fear so no part of me wanted to turn back but that was when my dad said to me, now that you know the truth of who you really are, your, if you choose to go back, your cancer will heal and it'll heal very quickly. So I want to say also that in that state, I was in what I call a state of clarity where everything made sense. It wasn't like, um, you know, I call it a state of God because it changed my understanding of what God is. Um, I used to think God was like a being um, and I used to project human um, qualities. Yes, human qualities onto God, and God had a gender, male gender. I don't feel that anymore. God is the collective of all of us, all of energy, all the universe. And I became one with that energy. So it's like a state of clarity. So it's not like you have some male God telling you, this is what you need to learn. This is it's almost like you awaken to this clarity. It's like, oh, I get it now. Oh my God, this makes sense. I understand why I had the cancer. It's more like that as opposed to somebody, you know, talking down to you. Um, and it's like being in a state of all that is where everything is known and like having a glimpse or emerging with it for a brief period of time where it's just so clear. I understood how, Every thought and every decision I had made during my life had somehow contributed to me being that person who got the cancer. And so it was with this state of clarity that my dad said, now that you know this truth, you need to go back. You need to go back and live your life fearlessly. Mm -hmm. And when I really got that, I, I did. I made the decision to come back. What and, was that like? You, so you make a decision and does something happen quickly or was it a transition and graceful? Was it abrupt? It was really like literally immediately that when I made the decision that I started opening my eyes and coming out of the coma. Oof, however, yeah. So even though I was opening my eyes, however, my brain hadn't adjusted yet. So I couldn't differentiate between that side, that realm, and this realm. And it was like I had one foot on each side. So as I was opening my eyes, and I'd been in the coma for about 30 hours, like not even two days, um, but I was opening my eyes, and my family were like ecstatic. Oh, my God, you're opening your eyes. And they were around me. And I said, and so I was talking as though I was still on the other side. I said, dad is here. Dad says it's not my time. And so they were wondering like, what am I saying? They couldn't figure it out. And then I started to say things. I was like completely. Um, like one foot in both worlds? Yes. And I was mixing both worlds up. Hmm. And I was saying to my husband, didn't the doctor say these were my final hours? But he's wrong because dad says, it's not my time. I'm going to be fine. We can take these tubes out. And they were like, whoa, no, don't take the tubes out. Because, and the doctors came rushing in and they said I was still really critical. But what was blowing everyone away was that I was relaying to them conversations that they said there was no way that I could have heard. Because they were, you know, they said, when I said, but didn't the doctor say these were my final hours? My husband said, oh my God, there's no way you could have heard that. We said that outside the room, down the hallway. That's where the doctor told me. And so things like that. And then I said, isn't that the doctor that was putting the tubes into my veins? And that doctor said, you couldn't have seen that. You were in a coma. And so um, that kind of blew them away and they knew something had happened. But it took about three or four days for me to start to realize what had happened. Um, but the tumors were just shrinking. They were just like they were melting away and the doctors couldn't explain it. And one of the doctors, my oncologist said, 
I don't even know what to write in the medical records because your tumors have shrunk 70% within a week. And he said, I have no explanation for what's going on. And in three and a half weeks, they could find no trace of cancer in my body. Wow. Yeah. So that then. is amazing. That is such a beautiful story on every level. I mean, first of all, from the standpoint, uh, the lessons you're already realizing as you're in critical stages of cancer, that you've been taking care of everybody. You have not been taking care of yourself. The thing you feared the most is actually occurring to you. And the experience of death you feared the most is imminent at this point. And then the fact that you transition, it's like so much grace to be held and loved through that experience, to have that incredible, uh, you know, expansion, the all, like molecules, the all that is, the energy is everything on a quantum level, and yet be able to have that kind of intimacy to know you've always been loved, you've always been held. Like most of us, you just didn't know it or had been taught otherwise. And the choice you're given and the bravery to come back. I do have to say, I love the idea that your dad gave you a bit of a guarantee. But he said, when you go back, your body's going to heal. You won't have to be in that anymore. So that's like, I'm sure, helped you a lot to make that choice. But yeah. I also love the fact of coming back and that everybody was mystified, and especially the doctors, because that's a point when science and spirituality are married, which I feel is where we should be fully existing right now, an and instead of an or. And you know, I don't know where that would take them and how that would, that would impact their life or their practice, but it is there for them to do so. And I know when you came back, Anita, that you had a lot of deep lessons that you learned and started to employ. And I want to get into that in the next segment and find out what it is you came back with that has created who you are right now. And we're just gonna take a little brief break to say you are listening to Dare to Dream podcast. This is Debbie Dashinger, and I'm thrilled that you are here with us listening to this amazing conversation. And I hope it's impacting you and maybe some of the life choices you've been making and can potentially make differently going forward. If you would like a free gift that I give to you about how to gain free publicity, how you can get Interviewed, use publicity to become the go-to expert in your field so your tribe can find you. Go to debbiedashinger.com and download it. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com and get your free gift. And if you are just starting to watch or tune in after we've begun, this is Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, and my guest today is Anita Morjani. Her website is Anita Morjani. Dot com. Uh, before I open up, Anita, to the broader idea of the deeper lessons, there's something you kept saying that is, for me, very big, the idea of self-love. And you brought it up several times. And I know it's something we all talk about, right? Self-love, self-love. <laughs> you know, you can't love anybody else till you love yourself. And I know that you say that love is not a luxury and that love isn't conditional. It's our birthright. I want to know from you the importance of love. And also, if self-love is so important, how do we actually get there? What is it we need to lower, get out of our way, invite in? Let me know, how do we actually create self-love? So um, that is a great question. So the thing is, currently, a lot of people believe that self-love means loving this physical body, which is true. It is loving this physical body, but it's much more than that. So uh, people say to me that, you know, I, I take care of myself, I follow the right diet and, and all these kinds of things. And so they, they tell me this and they say, I love myself, but still my life isn't quite going the way I want it to. Or they say, mm -hmm. I'm doing the affirmations and I'm, uh, I'm liking how I look or whatever, but my life isn't working the way I want it to. So what I tell people is that self-love is realizing that you are more than just a physical body and that you actually have a greater purpose. And it's about allowing yourself to be who you are. 
Um, so this is a big topic for me because I do entire workshops on, on, on this topic. So I'm going to try and condense it right down. I actually do retreats on this topic and I'll tell you why it's such a big topic because I tell people that, um, your, what you see, your physical body is like the tip of the iceberg. So, you know, if you know an iceberg, what you see above the water is only about 20% of the entire iceberg. If you went underwater, the, uh, what's under the water is actually bigger than what you see above water. So in other words, even with us, with the human being, the spiritual being, this physical part we see is only a small percentage of the non-physical part. And that is one of the biggest lessons I learned when I was on the other side, that even everything my physical self had been through, I had been through bullying, I had been through being racially discriminated against, I'd been through different various struggles, I'd been through having cancer. But the realization in that realm was, oh my gosh, but this physical body has been through all that. But what it's done is that it's enriched the spiritual body, which is so much greater. And it's made this spiritual body more powerful, more deeper, and more able to, to fulfill its purpose of changing the world or being bigger and being more confident in doing what it needs to do. But the, but the first thing you need to do is to realize that this physical body is not the whole you. It is only like a fraction of you. It's only the tip of the iceberg. So that's really the first part of it. And then the second part is getting in touch with the whole you and finding the purpose of the whole you and why you're here. And when you put things into context, it's like, I wouldn't change anything that happened to me. None of it. Because everything that I have been through, all that struggle, all that suffering, times when I have wanted to, to, to end my own life, mm -hmm. today has put me in a position where I can help so many more people than if I, if I still believed I was just that little person, that little tip of the iceberg who was running myself ragged, being a doormat for every person that came my way. Today, I can actually write and speak and stand on stage and shout from rooftops what it is to understand that you are actually an empathic being. The world needs you. You need to step into your power and you are much bigger than you think. And, and I can give people tangible examples from my own life where people will relate. People who are thinking of ending their life um, will relate to what I'm saying. People going through bullying, who going through racial discrimination, people who are going through cancer or the fear of illness, they all relate to what I'm saying. And so this is why I wouldn't change anything. Wow. Um, <laughs> so that's, yeah. So I guess the big part of loving yourself is realizing that your physical self, even though you do have to take care of it, that's not all of who you are. You're just the tip of the ice, iceberg. I just produced uh, an anthology book called I Am Still Here, Trials Turned Into Transformation. And I did it for the exact reasons you're saying. I went to an ending of a nine and a half year relationship that was actually pretty traumatic. And uh, it took me, um, yeah, it took me at least a year to get back on my proverbial feet and to want to even live. So I really intimate, uh, intimately understand, you know, and again, sacrificing myself, somebody else's business took me down and it really was hard to refine myself. But I have a lot of amazing healers in my life and God bless them for really showing up. Like that was totally the angels on the other side, not gonna let you go. And when I came out the other side, I felt so powerfully about it. You know, there had just been, uh, the deaths of Kate Spade and um, Anthony uh, Bourdain. Yes, which crushed me because I was a huge fan of Anthony Bourdain's. And I, it was mystifying. And yet I intimately understood. And I thought, I have to do something because so many are suffering. And so I gathered authors who had also contemplated from various walks of life, been through something so traumatic, but found their way to come back even better, more whole, more healed. And we each wrote a chapter about our stories in the hopes that we can help others out there. So I, I just feel like moved when you're talking about this. And when you're mentioning 
the love and the lessons. One thing that I know, Anita, because I know a lot of people have been through near-death experiences, and the pattern I've seen is that they go into a near-death experience one way, they actually pass, other side, choice, and then choose to come back, but they're different. Mm. They have different talents and skills. They have different ways of thinking and abilities. Was this so for you? Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, before the near-death experience, I was that doormat. I was that person that was self-sacrificing. I was that people pleaser. I was the person who got cancer. And, and um, what I found after the near-death experience was that it was, it was really hard because I had changed so dramatically because I understood that that person who I was was the person who, who got cancer. In other words, mm -hmm. if I went back to being that same person, I would only get cancer again. That so makes sense. I so get that. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. And so this is why I talk to a lot of people who have cancer or who have had cancer because many people who have had cancer have this fear that it's going to come back. Mm. And I talk to them about that fear and I tell them that person got cancer. You don't have to be that person anymore. It's not a physical illness. And this is the part where, um, I'm really going into stuff which is highly controversial, which um, people who've had cancer, people who are empaths, people who are on this track, they will understand me. And I have enough, uh, and I know enough people who do understand me and get what I'm saying, but it's very provocative and controversial amongst maybe the medical mainstream. Mm -hmm. and, and it is exactly that, that um, the fear of cancer is a bigger disease than the cancer itself. And in order to get out of that fear, I actually uh, help people to find the pattern in their lives that brought them to that place where they got cancer. And they find it very easily because here's the other thing I've noticed. And I wanna say there's no research to back this up, but I'm purely going by the people who have come to my events and who have written to me. Everybody who's written to me who has said they have cancer are empaths and they are people who have spent a lifetime of serving others making others feel better who have believed that it's selfish to take care of themselves who have bought into the belief that um, not only that it's selfish to take care of themselves but also that the work the spiritual healing work they do has to be done for free so they're struggling financially um, and they've also bought into the belief that the ego is bad. We have to suppress our ego. Um, and the thing is, those beliefs that spiritual, that we shouldn't charge for spiritual work, that we have to suppress the ego, mm -hmm. those beliefs are not good for empaths. They work against empaths. And that is one of the things I learned when I was on the other side. And so our body gets so tired. I used to suppress my ego because I believed it was... Um, it was bad that we're supposed to transcend our ego, suppress our ego. So I would squash my ego down. And every time I wanted to do something for myself, I would feel, no, no, that's my ego. I have to keep serving. I have to keep serving other people. And I squashed my ego so small to the point that I became invisible, that mm. my needs were not honored. That is a typical empath thing to do. Dean, so. this is so awesome. I just know there's so many people resonating on any part of that spectrum. So, uh, folks, and, again, we're going to come back. I promise you deeper lessons in this. And also, I want to go a little bit into law of attraction and healing power of transformation so we can really do a full circle here. Remember the amazing sponsors, and I thank them, thank them, Thinktific. It just seems like thank and Thinktific go together. And if you want a short demo of their online courses and their membership platform for entrepreneurs, they are the online education platform for independent entrepreneurs and creators to grow their business with online courses. Get your Dare to Dream listener special rates, TH nk.cc slash deb and i want to encourage you as far as dare to dream goes 
subscribe, leave a five-star review. It's so funny. I hear from people all the time. I download your shows all the time. It's like, awesome. Why don't you subscribe? We'll come right in your inbox. And also, if you leave a review, by the way, what you're actually doing, it is a great service because you're letting people who will benefit from this conversation, will enjoy this conversation. Basically, our tribe know that this exists. So keep doing that. So I want people to be able to enjoy even more than they already do at a bigger and bigger rate the amazing guests who come on like Anita Morjani today. So Anita, yes, big promise, deeper lessons. Tell me, amongst all the amazing things you've been sharing, which already feel so profound, what else did you learn that felt very deep and transformational to you? Uh, gosh, there were so many. So let me start with this. Um, this particularly applies to people who are empaths and, um, and people who are super sensitive and, and particularly though full-blown empaths, that if you are somebody who is super sensitive or you are a full-blown empath, what that means is that you feel things very deeply. You feel you're connected to a world beyond this one. Mm. And, and so it, you can feel other people's feelings within you. Now, what, uh, what it means, so it's a, in a way, it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, empaths are the ones who are most likely to feel their intuition, to feel things beyond this world. But the double-edged sword is that empaths are also the most likely, because they want everyone around them to feel good, to, they are also most likely to listen to everyone around them. So... The biggest thing I learned is that instead of giving my power away to everyone outside of me, trying to quieten all the voices outside of me, I had to give more power to my inner voice. So in, instead of having an outside-in world of the view where the outside world is real, I have to react to what's happening outside. No, as an empath, I had to refrain from doing that and go inside and react to what my inside was telling me. Yeah. That was the biggest thing I learned. And that, was, that has been so key and so important to me. And I know that when I lose my way, it's because I've been giving my power to the voices outside of me. That, and usually the more aggressive voices are the ones we end up giving our power to. And we have to stop doing that. We have to be aware that we have a tendency of doing that. And we really have to take the most, the, the most powerful voice as the one being inside of us. We have to tune in. We have to sit quiet. We have to connect with nature, do whatever we can, but always check in first. But empaths, because we're so eager to please everyone outside of us because we feel what they're feeling, we tend to do it the other way. And so I say it's a double-edged sword because empaths have the deepest connection to the inner world and yet tend to give our power to the outside world. So this yeah. is so big. <laughs> this is like this so bears repeating or reversing and replaying. This is like a mic drop. Boom. <laughs> I am so blown away by what you're sharing. I really am. And I want to like reiterate what I'm hearing and make sure I'm hearing this correctly. As empaths, as the deep sensitives, uh, first of all, you said something I've never heard before because I am so that, I'm a clairsentient, so it's deep in my space. I'm also an extreme extrovert, so to be very extroverted and love going to workshops and being social and being with people and also being a satellite dish, it can be very interesting because I can get depleted very quickly. And that's yes. interesting to manage. And I hear you saying, we actually have access to the other world, the other side, I, I assume, like the spiritual realm. Yes. I've never heard before, and that's amazing. And by virtue of who we are, we really are built with such deep sensitivity and connection inside. Yes. That would be our superpower. Yes. And yet, <laughs> we're our own kryptonite. And instead of employing that superpower, we are instead going outside to the world and the people and society and whatever else and saying, 
who, how do you feel? Is everything okay? Can I make you happy? You know, what am I doing wrong? Everything else. And of course, perceiving everybody's everything. Yes. And basing our life on that and reaction to that, as opposed to letting that go, coming back inside where everything already is and letting that be our real connection and wisdom guide. Boom. You got it. You got it. You got it in one. And there's more layers to this because once you unpack it, here's the other thing we do as empaths. We go outside to teachers, to gurus, when our own inner guru is inside of us. We give our power to other teachers and gurus. Um, and I'm not saying teachers are bad. It's great having teachers and, uh, and gurus and people to turn to. But always know that um, you have access inside. So what I tell people is go to see teachers, go and learn things, go. I mean, I want people to come to my workshops, but the purpose of my workshop is to empower you. It's to tell you mm. that you need to believe in you. I'm not asking you to believe in me. That's cool. my point. Yeah, so it's like, go see these people that probably your wisdom tells you to go see. Yes. And it's more tools for your toolbox, but they are not the leader, the guider, and the light in the way. It's actually already here. You just have more tools. Yes, in 100%. So when, so when you are following your inner guidance, you will be guided to the right teachers and leaders who will can take you further on that path. Um, but whereas if you are feeling that you have surrendered your, your power and believe that you can't get there without a particular te teacher or, or a particular teacher feels, makes you feel that you can't do it without them, mm. then they're not the right teacher for you. They need to make you feel empowered. In other words, the job of the teacher, the spiritual teacher, the healer, even healers, don't be afraid to go to healers. Right. But the job of each of these people is to awaken something within you so they eventually become redundant in your life. The job is not to create dependency. It's to create redundance. And that's the difference between a cult leader and a true teacher. Mm. You know, uh, Dr. Sue Mortar has been on this show, and before we actually started recording the show, she brought up your name, and I guess you guys are buddies and kind of live close and all of that, and I see why she adores you so much, and I see why, because she's also, like for me, unbelievably incredible. She is. I, I, get, I can imagine, the, I can and can't imagine the two of you together, but that must be magic. Oh, it's amazing. She's, she's gone on a book tour right now and I miss her so much because she's literally five minutes down the road from me. <laughs> wow. How lovely. Well, you guys have to FaceTime her, <laughs> Skype her or something <laughs> while she's on the road. But I really get it because she spoke so highly of you and, and well-deserved. Oh, wow. This is our final segment. So I, I have a couple of key questions I'd like to go through. Uh, so I want to start here. Can you still access that NDE, other side, light, total freedom, but now you're here back in physical form. Is there any translation still? Like you can access that if you want, or you're here with the lessons. So I do access it. I need to access it to recharge my batteries all the time. Hmm. And it's not it's not as hard or far away as it may seem because actually it's not, the veil is so thin that it almost doesn't exist. The veil between that realm and this realm, that it almost doesn't exist. Um, so, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners will, will, will relate to this, that they can feel it. So here's what prevents people from accessing it because it's actually very accessible okay. what prevents people from accessing it is the belief that it's our imagination which it isn't your imagination actually is the key to uh, to accessing this um the other thing is what um gets me annoyed is that in in this world of material scientists and all we are the ones who are made to feel woo woo because when we talk about it. And so we don't, so we don't talk about it, uh, or at least, you know, we're careful where we talk about it. 
But in actuality, I believe that what I experience and the way I've applied it to my life is the real way and it's the way we're meant to believe, meant to do it. And I feel the ones who are struggling and suffering the most are the ones who have shut off this other side. But once you're aware it's there, once you um, allow yourself to go inward, it's not hard to access it at all. It's like when I had the MBE, it was like a reminder of who I really am and a reminder that it's always there for me. And it was like the door opened again and it hasn't closed. That's kind of what it feels like. That's Grace. Um, your videos, you've got, and for folks who are listening and love this, she's got tons of videos. She does Facebook Lives. You can easily follow her and get even more. You discuss in your videos and on your website the idea of unpacking the law of attraction. So I would be very curious to hear your unique understanding of LOA, as we like to call it, or the law of attraction. Sure. So when I had cancer, um, I had people telling me all the time that your thoughts, re uh, your thoughts create your reality um, and you attracted it with your thoughts. And this idea actually frightened me because um, I thought of myself as a very positive person. I actually did. I was always cheerful. I always made sure I was cheerful and happy for everyone. But it made me fear my thoughts because I feared the cancer and I believed that my fear for the cancer is what caused the cancer. And, um, and so I would try and suppress that fear, but I would fear my fear thinking, oh my God, this fear of my thoughts and this fear of cancer is now increasing the cancer because my thoughts are creating my reality or attracting my reality. So this made me go into this whole downward spiral of fear because I was fearing the cancer and I was fearing my thoughts about you fearing. You can't win. You, you can't, can't win. You're metaphysical and you can't win, right? Yeah, you can't win. And it was only when I was in the other side did I realize that the most important thing is to love yourself and to know that you are deserving and worthy. So when I, anyway, when I had the cancer, I was doing all the vision boards and everything. I was taking pictures of people who were healthy and fit and were putting it on my vision board. And because that was what I wanted more than anything, you know, was to be healthy and fit. And that was what I focused on. When I was on the other side, that's when the true clarity came to me that when you know your purpose, when you know you are so much more, when you love yourself and you know that you need to love yourself and you're worthy and deserving of all the things you came here to be and experience, you don't need to worry about the law of attraction anymore. Because um, when you love yourself, you, um, you allow yourself to be authentic. Like when I said, my dad said, go and live your life fearlessly. What he meant was go and be yourself fearlessly. Mm. Um, when you allow yourself to be who you are, then you already attract um, who you are authentically. In other words, the way the law of attraction works is we don't attract by our thoughts. We attract by who we are. And the more you love yourself and the more you live authentically, the more what you attract reflects that. So you don't even have to watch your thoughts. When you watch your thoughts, you're sending yourself the message that my thoughts are not good enough. I have to suppress them. I have to watch them, that I am flawed, that I am negative. So I have to be more positive. You're actually sending yourself the opposite message. Um, and you're telling yourself that uh, there's something wrong with me. And that's why I have to watch my thoughts. Mm -hmm. When you suppress your fears, you're telling yourself, my fears are unjustified, they're bad, so I have to suppress it. So I tell people, just be who you are. If you're fearful in this moment, allow it, just allow it. And once you let it out, it passes. But when you suppress it, it's, it stays there with you for, for longer. And every time it rears its head, you suppress it more because you think it's going to attract a negative reality. But when you realize that, all of you is perfect. You don't judge it. You stop having to worry about the law of attraction because you attract 
from this space of realizing that I am fine. I love myself. Um, the other thing I also tell people is that uh, I don't do vision boards anymore because what has manifested in my life is so much bigger and better than anything I could have envisioned. And so when you allow yourself to truly be who you are, maybe what life has in store for you is much bigger than any goal or, or vision that you can come up with for your vision board. Oh, that is so awesome. Oh my God. You know, every time I've ever been in a space where there's somebody speaking and they say, where do you see yourself in five years? Have a picture of where you are in 10 years. I just, I don't know if it's not, I mean, I think I'm visual, but I go inside and there's nothing. I can't even, I, I have no idea. So I love the freedom you're talking about. Like why even go there? Because it's actually limiting, right? Yes. It contracts the jar of who you are, where you live, as opposed to like, being this and allowing and receiving probably way beyond what we ever expected we could and should. Exactly. Because as an empath, you always play yourself down. It's like, you're going to say, no, there's no way I'm going to be doing this or I'm going to be a speaker or an author. There's no, there's no way. But the thing is, you don't even have to Think about that. All you're doing is being authentic and loving yourself as much as you can in this moment. That's all you have to do. And if you do that in every moment, you have no idea what's in store for you. Well, many decades ago, I was in a 12-step program, and I very much loved the big book, as they call it. And um, although I couldn't probably quote almost anything from it, the one thing I actually got out of it that was life-changing for me was this phrase, and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. And although I think most people interpret it, I could be wrong, most people interpret it as, oh, I have an issue over here. If I just accept it, everything will be fine. But something happened to me along the way, and I started to realize I actually suppressed my emotions. So if I felt angry, it was not okay to be angry, right? I didn't even know process it. If I was disappointed and deeply hurt, I had no idea what to do with it. And one day that phrase came up and acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. And I thought, wow, what if I just sat with this and felt angry? What if I gave myself permission to be angry? <laughs> That's it. And it's amazing. Like, okay, I felt it. I gave myself permission. I said, yeah, that makes sense based on what happened. And what was crazy, awesome to me and unexpected is that it transmuted like that, like the anger was gone. And I thought, yeah. oh my God, all this time I was so busy resisting it and keeping it in place, when in fact, when I gave myself permission to feel what was real, it yeah. actually managed itself and left my body. Wow, you put that so beautifully. You really put it beautifully. And that is exactly it, because up until then until I had the NDE, I was resisting so much of who I am. Mm -hmm. And every kind of teaching, spiritual teaching that I had learned up to that point, had um, it could possibly be my own misinterpretation, so I don't want to blame any, anybody or any teaching. But judging things as being bad or wrong or not the way to do it, you're kind of watching yourself and you're resisting and you're suppressing. So you put that so beautifully because the NDE freed me to just be who I am and not resist anything. If I feel anger, it's like, okay, that's what I'm feeling right now. Obviously a part of me needs to feel that. If I feel fear, okay, that's what I'm feeling right now. And all of it just passes. It passes when there's no resistance. Mm. I love that. I love what you said. Ditto. And so this is Dare to Dream, Anita. And I know you're not doing visions or setting goals. Do you have a Dare to Dream? Do you have a space, something you'd love to create that's not here yet? Yeah, I, I, I do. In fact, it's interesting because even though I say I don't do the whole goals or anything, but yeah, I do dream. And my dreams have got bigger they were really small years ago but but when i've seen what's happening and what can happen uh, my dreams have got bigger and bigger and i would love 
I guess my real dream is that I would love to be involved in a big way in some kind of, I don't know whether it's a, to say it's a paradigm because it's so big, it has no words, where there is a complete change in this world as to how illness and cancer is viewed, where mainstream, and I would love to be involved in it, but where the mainstream way of treating cancer is no longer chemotherapy, radiation, drugs, and sterile hospitals where people feel even more fear and, and mm -hmm. sick just by going into hospital, where it's completely the opposite, where it's recognized that people who have cancer, um, in fact, they should be feeling, being, they should be made to feel good and not even more fear of their cancer. So in other words, it's huge because our medical system, medical paradigm is huge, but to actually have a complete complete rehauling of the way we view cancer, the way we label it, maybe even get rid of that word completely and see it as something different. I mean, it's so huge that it's not even tangible, mm. but to really, yeah, for the fear of cancer to be gone because people suddenly see it differently in a huge way. I'm just moved to share this. I typically would never after asking someone their dream. So I want to like, let that sit for a minute because it's a beautiful dream and i hope we're all giving it energy to create my brother had stage four cancer uh squamous cell i think it's three years ago four years ago and it was big right and he went through the chemo he went through the radiation he went through a subsequent surgery and so forth and to fast forward he is clean today completely clean healthy all of that and it changed his life. So um, he's a very well-known Grammy-nominated composer and his wife, therapist, social worker, and also meditation teacher. And it changed the paradigm of everything they do because on top of what he still does as a profession, he couldn't stand what it was like being in the waiting room yeah. where you're already anxious in a doctor's office about the news you might get or the tests you may have or the pain. And then there's a television with news, right? Yeah. So they created a television that has beautiful scenery, that has incredible expressions on it, and music that is, by the way, even for healthy people, the most beautiful thing I've ever seen, the most calming. And they also created a free meditation app to support uh, cancer caregivers, doctors, as well as the patients, so that if and while they're going through this, they can actually have meditations specific to what they're going through yeah. to help to change their world and more. You know, now they have booths and speak all over the country, and they did uh, Fran Drescher's Cancer Schmancer recently, and um, and so it's amazing uh, something so messy and tragic like that how when you make the choice for it to be opportunity on the other side, it can completely change the trajectory of who you are and what you offer out into the world. Wow, that's beautiful what your brother's done. That's really, really beautiful. Good, good on him because that is exactly what I'm thinking of because I know that even the um, cancer that I had, I know that if I knew then what I know now, I would never have got cancer. Mm -hmm. And so this is why I think that our whole cancer paradigm, the way we understand it, the way that um, our medical model believes or thinks that cancer is purely a physical illness that needs to be attacked with physical, um, you know, just purely on the physical level with drugs and, and diagnostic tools. I actually believe that's not where the cure for cancer will be found. I think it'll be found when we really understand what are the triggers within each person that causes that. And I look forward to a day um, when, when we consider things like um, chemotherapy and radiation and, and the traditional diagnostic tools like mammogram and all this, when we consider all these as being, being a very archaic way of treating an illness that is not purely physical. I really believe that illnesses start, you know, I told you that all you, that we are just the tip of an iceberg and more of us is uh, unseen. Illness starts at that unseen level. 
Mm-hmm. And that is the level that needs to be looked at and healed and recognized, not at the physical. When we heal that level, the physical will heal. That's what I truly believe. That's what I'd like to see. And, and because of that, I've actually also um, developed meditations and things. Um, like I, there's a musician by the name of Barry Goldstein. I don't know if you've heard of him. I have. Yes. Oh, yeah. Cause he's done meditation CDs with Neil Donald Walsh and, um, Joe Dispenza. So he and I are currently working on our second meditation CD, the first one we put out in 2016, which is also to help people going through illnesses and and other challenges so that it helps them to go inward and work through whatever issues they have so that it helps them to become that changed person. Like, for example, what you said about your brother, he's completely changed. He's not that person anymore who had the cancer. And one of the reasons why doctors tell people you have, um, you're not cured, you're in remission, is because they believe there's a chance that the cancer will come back. And I actually think from the greater perspective, the reason why they're seeing it come back in people is because people haven't healed at the true level, the deeper level. They've only just attacked it on the physical level mm. with the with you know with the physical tools that the doctors provide but when you heal it at yeah. the real level at the metaphysical level mm. you know that it's not going to come back you stop fearing it you're at a different level that's what i where i try and take people who have cancer or who have had cancer take them to that space where they know ah this is what caused it i'm not that person anymore i'm not in remission. I am done with cancer. And I tell them that if they're told that they're in remission, um, turn that word into remember my mission. Oh, oh my God. That's so amazing. Remember my mission. Yeah. And if they remember their mission, they, they're done with it. They're done with cancer. Anita more Johnny, you are welcome on this show any time that was extraordinary conversation and offering of so much valuable content and i feel deeply moved by being with you today wow thank you thank you you ask amazing questions and i could you know uh i thoroughly loved this this interview as well very very much so Mm. thank you Again, you can find her at anitamorjani.com. Feel free to post your comments. Trust me, I read them and see them all. And I love that you love this show. And I, I already can imagine all that you have to share and the wisdom you're gaining from today's conversation. I end today's show with a quote from Anita Morjani, which is, you see, in every moment, you have a choice to either honor the part of you that craves something more or to continue squeezing into a role that doesn't fill your cup. In the next weeks on Dare to Dream, I'm featuring Anna Raimondi and Vicki Gay. These are going to be big transformational conversations. And remember, that's Dare to Dream, your number one transformational conversation. Go to debbiedashinger.com to get your publicity report for free, how to become the go-to expert and be interviewed today on media, your online platform for any programs you want to sell to make passive income, thnk.cc slash Deb. And remember, the secret of success is having the courage to begin in the first place. Thanks for joining us today on Dare to Dream.